but uh, have, if you have questions about that, uh, Kubernetes, things like that, uh, he's the guy that you wanna you wanna talk to. And with that, Matt Johansson. Thanks. I don't deserve any of that, but thanks, thanks, Karthik. <laughs> uh, yeah, that South by talk was fun. Ooh, water. So uh, thanks for making the trek all the way to this track. Uh, you know, the other tracks are in a different zip code, so I was worried the room was going to be empty. Um, but yeah, I'm Matt Johansson. I work for a startup down here at uh, Honest Dollar, so I have to give the obligatory, hey, this is my job to let me take the day off and come here. Uh, we, we do uh, retirement plan alternatives for small businesses, and that's all I'll say about that. I'm not going to make this big pitch. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been a security guy for probably over a little over a decade now. Uh, that's kind of where I've focused most of my time. Uh, I like to say I'm a wannabe developer. You know, they, they let me write code every once in a while. Uh, don't let anyone you know, fool you. I do have some code running in production at, at Honest Dollar. That kind of scares the crap out of me. Should scare anyone who uses us. But yeah, some security stuff. Uh, I pretend every once in a while. The talk that uh, Karthik and I gave at uh, South by was about Gauntlet. So we're, we're, we're uh, contributors there. How many of you guys know about Gauntlet? Cool. This is the right crowd for me to be talking to. So, and I've done this speaking thing a few times, and I own uh, a few giant dogs. That, that's my that's my dog Kona out there. Um, all right, so quick agenda. So uh, we're going to start with, you know, what is Kubernetes? I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, that's how I pronounce it. Um, you know, I go to, this is kind of a little bit out of the echo chamber for me. I usually talk at more security conference type stuff, not really developer conferences. So uh, I'm going to just give the, how many of you guys are familiar with Kubernetes? I assume most of you if you're sitting in this room. Okay, cool. How many of you have used it or use it daily? Much less. Okay, cool. So you guys have heard about it. Not a lot of users. Great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go over kind of cursory level and then try to stick to to my area, which is security. Uh, I think the talk after me is actually someone who works on Kubernetes. So stick around for that one uh, for him to you know tell you know tell you guys where I lied to you about everything that that I lied to you about. Um, but yeah, I sit with our back end team and uh, I, I I know enough to be dangerous about uh, Kubernetes. But uh, we we. This talk is going to basically give some lessons learned. Uh, Honest Dollar has been around for about a year. Uh, we just got acquired, actually, and uh, and and we've been all in on Kubernetes and the Google Cloud pat platform since day one. So we've got kind of bumps and bruises to go with it. So hopefully, we can get into that. Uh, kind of along the way is why we use it. You know, what are the actual benefits of using it? Not because the you know hashtag Netflix does it or whatever uh, gets talked about a lot. Um, okay, what was our actual decision-making process? You know, why do we do this whole microservice thing to begin with, containerization? Um, some security pitfalls. So uh, I was fortunate enough to get hired at uh, this company pretty early on uh, in, in the days of, you know, uh, of its entire lifespan. And uh, so I didn't really have too many bad habits to break, which was kind of nice. I didn't really have a lot of stuff to undo. Uh, how many security people are, are in the room? Just so I have a, okay, hand fill more than I thought, but uh, everyone look at Dan, he's a CISO, he's a suit, don't let him fool you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, they, we definitely have some pitfalls. I came in and, and, uh, and saw some things that out of the box kind of made me nervous, and we'll go through that, so hopefully some people who are thinking about using Kubernetes or are using it early on can, can uh, catch these things early. And then there's some, some really great perks out of the box also, so it's not just all like trap doors and things that you can do wrong right out of the box. Uh, I'm not going to beat up them I'm on, on them too hard because I actually really like them. But uh, you know, security benefits of just containerization in general, but also Kubernetes and the and the orchestration that it that it brings you. And then we'll go through some examples, and that's really kind of the the fruit of the talk. Uh, no live demos. I didn't sacrifice the the requisite goat to make that work today. So we're just going to go through some some ideas, and hopefully, uh, uh, you know, we'll learn a thing or two. So Kubernetes. So. Uh, I don't even want to give a definition to this crowd. This would probably be for when I use these slides at a security conference. Uh, it's going to be wasted on you guys. But yeah, basically for anyone who's not familiar, it is container orchestration. Uh, we use it in the Google Container Engine, so it's you know it's actually on the Google Cloud Platform and it's kind of a hosted version of uh, of this orchestration. And this is just a just a high level overview of kind of what it looks like. I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a setup for anyone who hasn't used it uh, day to day. Uh, so that you know, as I go forward, you'll you'll kind of catch some words and know what I'm referring to, right? So, uh, you know, basically, it's just Kubernetes is going to set up a whole bunch of uh, nodes and VMs for you that the containers are going to 
find themselves on based on definitions in YAML config files. And uh, we'll see a few examples as we go here. Uh, and they're all controlled by uh, Kubernetes master in GKE. That uh, master is managed by Google. Uh, you know, you don't have too much control over it, which is actually nice for a small team like us in startup. So we don't have to kind of outsource the <laughs> that bit to Google, which is nice. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, there, there's this kind of containerization network, this container network that, that goes along all the uh, all the Kubernetes nodes. So I've already said node a few times. So just this is the kind of the glossary of <laughs> what I'm going to say the rest of the time. So when I hear when you hear these words, is what you think, right? So Kubernetes has this, uh, you know, all these. Uh, these ideas of what a node, a pod, a replication controller is. So pod, basically a group of containers. Replication controllers is where I spend a lot of my time uh, when I'm making new uh, container services or anything like that. This is the YAML definitions of uh, what that container is, uh, what that whole pod lifecycle is going to be, kind of the, the configuration. And replication controllers and services kind of go hand in hand uh, in that way. And then kind of an important topic that I'm going to hit a lot on in the talk is clusters. So we have these ideas of these cluster networks, right? Uh, so you can, you can kind of have one big cluster or a bunch of different clusters, but that's going to be your network that your, your nodes live on and the containers get spread out through. So uh, all of these config files are, are managed by uh, these YAML files and they uh, they tend to get a little messy uh, if you guys have, have used this and, and you don't kind of come at this the right way uh, and you're trying to hard code these things. You can kind of trip over yourself a bunch if you're trying to keep them all in line and, and, and do too much with them or you know, make, make one that's too big or anything like that. It comes with all the same uh, pitfalls as say like a Docker file would come if you try to get too crazy and complicated there. Uh, so that's something that, that, that we learned the hard way and we'll get a little bit more into. Um, so. Uh, you know, we've got these, these sense of a different environment, right? If you're actually running this for a company and not for fun, you, you've got these, uh, these senses of the prod, the dev, and the QA environments. So, you know, what do we need to do to keep in mind uh, what code lives where and, and how to manage all that uh, in, in a way that, okay, especially for a security guy, I know that what's being tested in pre-prod is actually what ends up in prod. The versions all match up. I have you know, my gold star over here that says, yeah, this passed my sniff test, and that's actually what got deployed out into production. Uh, there's there's kind of some pitfalls there. Uh, persistence gets a little tricky, especially when you're doing upgrades and migrations. If you, uh, we use Cassandra, uh, and, and you know, th there's been a few times where we had to say, thank God we backed up and uh, did that snapshot, because uh, things get a little tricky there when you're moving, especially between clusters. And, um, this is kind of a claim. I stole this line from one of my back-end developers talked at one of the local Kubernetes meetups, and, and uh, this claim that he made, right, is that, you know, Docker is not actually the secret sauce that we use for containerization. It is actually the orchestration that Kubernetes provides us that is the secret sauce for us. Um, and the claim that he made is we, can, we could replace Docker, Docker with another container technology, and uh, nothing really would change for us uh, in terms of environment except for how we built those containers. Um, so that's his claim, not mine. You can beat him up later. I'll point him out. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's uh, kind of the mantra that, that we use here, right? So let's get into a few of these pitfalls. These are kind of some bumps and bruises that I've learned along the way. Um, and uh, things that, you know, we kind of came into as, hey, we got to get this MVP out the door. I'm sure, you know, being in Austin, there's people in the room that have the same kind of mindset that, that we had to have, right? Um, and so when I got hired, we came in and uh, we had one big cluster. Right? We had one cluster network. All of our environments lived on this same network. Uh, they were all managed in one repository. Uh, and all the YAML files looked a lot alike, but you just had to know which one you were editing to know which environment you were editing. Right? It's a pretty easy trap to fall into because it starts small and then all of a sudden gets really big. Um, also, from a security guy's point of view, is these are all on the same IP space. Right? So if your uh, you know, dev environment is where people deploy constantly, right, with, you know, much less controls in place in terms of, you know, build pipeline security or manual code review or automated code review or whatever it is that you don't do in dev, but you kind of start to do in QA and then you definitely do in production. Uh, if all of these live on the same space, IP space, and you get a problem in dev, th that's, that's security guy here's pivot, right? That's a pivot point. Uh, the, and, and especially if your data and your database also live on this network, uh, that scared me, right? Coming in, I said, hey, we got to separate these things, right? 
so uh, this is kind of what we did early on, right? We had this is what a, for those of you who haven't you know seen a Kubernetes YAML, this is kind of uh, what well you've all seen YAMLs. Well, who am I kidding? But uh, this is kind of what it looked like, and and we defined our namespaces, and that's how we kind of manage things. We see, you know we had to set our namespace, and then do whatever work you're going to do, and then kind of you know set a different namespace and do some work over there. So it all really was dependent on the person behind the keyboard had to know exactly what namespace they were in in the terminal in order to make sure that they were making the change to the right thing, right? There was no actual connection change. They were all on the same network, right? So again, security guy, spidey senses were going off here. Um, this was the particular mess that, that uh, you know, really started to get kind of hairy and, and apparent that we needed to change was we had this repository with this directory structure of you know, prod dev and QA with basically the same YAML files over and over and over again. And then you kind of had to match your pull requests up to see which kind of got promoted to which branch and all this kind of stuff. This is total duplication of work all over the place and it's really error prone. And you wind up with some versioning problems and you wind up with you know, a whole bunch of different stuff that you, know, you just don't want to deal with, right? Especially if this is this kind of one cluster to rule them all and this, you know, you're deploying code into a network that your kind of crown jewels and your data live on, you definitely don't want this to kind of trip you up and, and get in the way, right? So what we did, um, what I did, what I kind of was the driving force behind, uh, whether uh, some people were grumpy or not, no, we all kind of like it better, is uh, we, you know, we make these three different clusters. We have these separation of concerns. So uh, this is something I recommend definitely if you guys are looking this out. Don't start with this one big cluster and say, oh, we'll change that later, because it's really hard to change. Um, and so, you know, this took us a while, but we, we've got, you know, our dev, our QA, and our production, uh, not namespaces anymore, actual different Kubernetes clusters with their, with their own set of YAMLs, and we'll get into how I avoid that duplication uh, of work and that separation of concerns in a second. But uh, the other thing that's nice here is, uh, you know, we have this idea of a bastion host, like a jump host. I'm sure this is, you know, something that's familiar to you guys, right, that uh, if, in order to you know get into any of these boxes uh, from wherever you're working, you know it's not like we just have every port open on all these things just to the internet and happy go lucky just hop in, right? So we've got this bastion host that we you know we do uh, some serious monitoring on, and and that's kind of everyone's gateway to the cluster, um, and that really helps when you, when you do this. You can even have separate bastion hosts if you want. Uh, you can, you can kind of segregate it uh, in, in a bunch of different ways, but it definitely makes uh, much more granular uh, on your monitoring side of things. So you know exactly who's accessing which environment when and why and what commands they're running and, and so on and so forth. And we'll get to monitoring later, but um, this kind of solves the, this whole pivot problem you know, for us. In, in my head, it was, hey, okay, these things you can't, if you know if you land and do something wrong in dev, that doesn't mean that you got access to our production data and database, right? So security guy, somewhat happier, right? Um, but you still have to worry about this environment stability, right? So now you've got these three separate clusters. That's great, but what about that uh, duplication of work and the managing of those YAML files uh, in that way that just really didn't make a lot of sense? So there's a few options right now. I know you know Kubernetes is, is pretty early on its life cycle, so. There is the beginnings of a bit of a, you know, some puppet support. I'm sure someone in this room knows more than, than I do about that. Uh, it's not the road that, that we were going down. It was a little too early uh, to make sense for the way that we did things. Um, kind of the, the Kate's uh, documentation suggests that you do some shell scripts with some templates. And the way that we're kind of exploring it and the way that we, we, we've been doing it is uh, some rake files and some templates, right? So. Uh, if we can do as much as possible with uh, dynamic, you know, kind of parameterized YAML files uh, with some config files that are very easy to track, now all of a sudden our pull requests are very obvious who's changing what, when, and why, uh, and then also our, you know, bring up and bring down some service or environment are kind of as easy as uh, the bottom bit there. Oh, all my colors don't work on the screen. I've got different colors up there. All right. Uh, but yeah, you just kind of hop into whatever environment you're gonna, uh, you want to bring up or bring down for whatever reason, or you can even go more granular and say instead of just rake up the whole environment, you could say, hey, I started this uh, logging service over here. I'm gonna go ahead and just rake this bit down and upgrade it and rake up, whatever it is. 
you know exactly what's going on and you've got the, the files to go in and know exactly uh, which parameters are, are, uh, are being changed. This also helps with things like version control. Um, you know, it, it, it becomes much easier in these configuration files to, to visualize. This made a lot of, uh, you know, management happier, right? Like we can say, hey, look, this is exactly what we're running in all of these environments and we have the proof and we've got the paper trail and we've got the pull requests and all this kind of stuff. Being a financial tech company, that trail helped uh, enormously uh, in a lot of conversations uh, that, that we've been having and, and you know, th this is what made it possible. Um, some th you know, obvious lesson learned, this, this is kind of the, the point of this, this conference, right? But it, so it might be obvious to this crowd, but uh, it, it bears repeating is uh, things like hotfixes that kind of go uh, around your normal uh, deploy lifecycle. Uh, we actually find that those are the things that get written over most frequently, right? So uh, I don't have the stat on the screen, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember the number, but um, when it comes to web vulnerabilities, the number, the reopen rate of a vulnerability, like a vulnerability gets fixed and then it comes back, that same vulnerability comes back later, uh, that reopen rate is higher, the higher severity of the vulnerability. And uh, the kind of the theory behind that is because most of those are probably hot fixes, right? That scared someone enough that said, hey, go fix this right now, skip the whole process, get this out to production, because holy crap, right? That skipped the whole process, and then you regressed right over it a few weeks later when you didn't kind of push that hot fix down the line, right? Uh, so that's, you know, it's, it, like I said, it, it's kind of probably wasted on this crowd, but it's a good one to, to say, especially from security uh, perspective, uh, it, it definitely adds to it. Um, yeah, and then the versions and de dependencies between environments, like I said, it's pretty obvious, but it's a good one. Okay, so this one, who, <laughs> who ran into this problem? It, for those of you who have actually used Kubernetes, who ran into a similar problem with when, if you were using something as type load balancer, which is a nice, super nice feature uh, that Kubernetes uh, allows you to use, uh, something that we realized that as a security guy I cared about and a lot of other people on the internet don't care about, <laughs> which makes me kind of frustrated, I've got a few issues open on GitHub for this one, is uh, this loses the real IP. You just lose the source IP header completely if you use this. There's no way to get it. Um, this is just due to the nature of, it's a network load balancer in the Google Cloud environment. It's not an HTTP load balancer. So the X forwarded for, X real IP, all those headers are just like not retained at all, right? They, they just don't, don't make it into your logs, don't make it anywhere on your side of the app. So security guy building monitoring systems all of a sudden realizes that uh, all of his traffic is coming from 10.IP addresses and that's not actually doing me any good in terms of uh, preventing anyone from doing anything or monitoring who's doing what on my site or where or when. Um, so our solution for this, there might be different solutions, better solutions, but this one was pretty easy, was uh, we, we just broke our Nginx instance out uh, from you know container pod Kubernetes land and just put it uh, on a raw VM in in Google Cloud Platform, put that behind their native HTTP load balancing, and then that retained everything all the way through uh, to, to our app. Uh, they've got a feature called type node ports. I should have included the screenshot, but I forgot. Uh, type node port to actually expose the, the web service backend to, and you can do type node port to Nginx. Uh, kind of trick there is make sure that you know your firewall rules are only accept, you're, you're opening a node port to by default, everything. Uh, you don't want to do that, so maybe only accept connections from this Nginx box that you that you put in that VM land, and then uh, that's that's on you know static IP uh, space or the Google load load balancing HTTP load balancing space. Um, this was a big one for us. This this was uh, this took a lot of rearchitecture once we did it that way, and then trying to back out and rip Nginx out took a long time. Uh, we did this at the same time as breaking dev, QA, and prod out. It's kind of a painful process. So if I can impart to start <laughs> this way, I hope it saves someone some headache later. Uh, you know, uh, kind of where this stands in Kubernetes land is that, uh, that this is how cloud load balancing works and it's not really something that, you know, they, they have control over. So we'll, we'll see if that gets fixed later, but you know, this is the way we're solving it for now. Okay. Who can tell me what's wrong with this picture? 
for those of you who um, used Kubernetes or those of you who haven't and can kind of just construe what I'm talking about here, who wants to shout what's, what's wrong here? Go ahead, Matt Pissarro. <laughs> uh, yeah, this command just gives you a bash you know, on whatever pod or container you wanted to hop into. Remember that whole thing I talked about a few slides ago about setting up that bastion jump host that only you can get through and then once you're in there, you can get to those other things? Well, this command laughs in your face and then flips you off and then lets them in anyway, right? So this, uh, this kind of just goes right around that whole firewall rule uh, and, and lets anyone into anything. So I, I, spent, I spent a good few days setting up this whole, setting up my firewall rules the way I wanted them, setting up this whole bastion jump host. And my developers looked at me and said, hey, look, this, this still works. Uh, that's nice. Thanks for the instructions on that bastion host. We're not going to do that because we never SSH'd anyway. We just did this because uh, this was easier. And uh, yeah. So uh, I don't have a happy story about this one. This is kind of where this stands. Uh, what makes me feel a little bit better is this is a uh, HTTPS reverse proxy. So there is some uh, you know, idea of, OK, this isn't just wild, wild west. Um, but you can do a whole bunch of stuff in here. Um, any of you security people who are thinking about using Kubernetes who want to go vote on my GitHub issue to, <laughs> to have two-factor enabled on kubectl, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy about that. Uh, I tried to, tried to look at it, and it's not something that the wannabe developer can, can help on. So uh, yeah, that, this one is kind of scary. Uh, it's also super useful, the kubectl tool. Uh, from my backend team's perspective is magic, right? Um, this is how we, how we run uh, all of our stats, all of our usage. This is, I mean, this is invaluable when we're doing deploys, upgrades, uh, anything. Is We live in, in kubectl land, and, uh, and, and that's how we monitor which containers on which node, uh, you know, which nodes are having problems. Uh, what IP address got assigned to that thing because I need to have a log point there. Whatever, kubectl makes that really, really easy. So that's super nice. Um, but that little exec, here you go. Here's remote code execution on this thing, of course. Uh, scares me a little bit. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Um, all right, so some perks. So this is kind of, um, like I said, the crux of kind of what I want to get to. The last slide in my present I'm going to spend the most time on. So. Um, we're only a few slides away. So um, security benefits just of containerization in general. There are a ton. Um, a lot of things are really easy for me that a lot of my friends have a really hard time with, uh, like patching um, or just upgrading in general or, hey, I think something happened on that container. My response is, okay, just kill it. Right, like that's that's invaluable. That's that's my response: is kill it, and we'll figure out how it happened. You know, if if we start to see it happening again quickly, just should it just pull the plug. But if we don't, we have some time. We can figure out what happened. Right, uh, patching is like, oh hey, I saw this new uh, you know zero day come across the line. What do we do about it? Oh, uh, you mean just like Docker, just rebuild the container, and then it just grabs the, the latest version of everything, and we're good. Okay, cool. You know, this stuff gets really, really easy. Uh, you know, and 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 yeah, I'm kind of painting with broad brushstrokes here, but but seriously, nine times out of ten, uh, containerization has saved my ass when it comes to certain things coming out. Like, uh, it's it's also why I'm upset that I had to break Nginx out of the container. But you know, uh, it is what it is. So so that's really nice. Um, also, if you if you're using containerization the way containerization is actually supposed to be used, and not like mini VMs, or you're not treating them like VMs, you're actually treating them like containers, and you're saying, okay, there's one process per container. Uh, that adds a whole ton of security benefits, like, hey, you don't have all this other stuff on the operating system that you've never used, uh, and it doesn't matter, and it doesn't need to be there, but then all of a sudden you need to worry about if a vulnerability comes out in curl or something that like, oh, okay, why was that on that box anyway? Like, you, no one should ever be running curl from that thing. Um, so, so that's really nice also, um, you know, and, and as we move forward, a lot of those base images and Docker containers are getting smaller and smaller um, and, and realizing this, like the things like Alpine are coming out and it's just like strip for parts. It's like they tried to take that VM off of a really short runway and said, you know, lose the seats, lose the, 
whatever the heck we can until we get this off, and that's, that's, that makes me really happy, right? Because uh, then we're only installing what's absolutely necessary. So your footprint, your, you know, your, kinda, your vulnerability landscape is much, much smaller, right? Um, mobility is also really nice, right? If you're not having a problem in your container or in that process that is running something, whatever your example uh, you want to come to, uh, but you are having a problem with the host that it's sitting on, um, most of the time you can just move it and figure out what's on, what's wrong with that host. And you know, if it's a security patch on the underlying node or whatever it is, if you're upgrading in general, like the whole upgrade process is pretty great. It's just, oh, hey, kill nodes. Containers kind of find new nodes to, to live on for a while, bring new node up, and they kind of find the new node that they've got to live on, and that's it. Now you've got a patched, uh, patched host, right? So that's great. Um, total segregation, right? So we've got these, not only do we have these limited processes, we've got them living on their nice little islands and silos uh, that, are, that are super great. Um, so less ability to pivot around. I know it's kind of, I'm hitting on that motif a, a bunch, but you know, when you're talking about cloud computing, this is something you should be thinking about is, is this pivot service. Uh, typically short lifespan is a big one, right? Um, I should have stole this just slide uh, from one of the guys at Etsy that has got a screenshot of, of some, some box that's been a lot uptime like years. And <laughs> it's like, oh, I feel so bad for the person that had to keep that thing alive for that long, right? Because uh, you know, containers, uh, they, could, they could be alive for days, they could be alive for minutes, it doesn't really matter as long as there is some container to you know, receive the request, especially if you're stateless. So we use JWT on our side, so that's really nice too because we don't care which you know, API endpoint the requests hit. Um, if, if there is an endpoint to hit, the request will be handled and the user won't notice a difference, right? Um, so I kind of talked about the upgrade process on Kubernetes side. Um, the build pipeline stuff is really great. I mentioned Gauntlet early on. A bunch of you raised your hands. Uh, I can't, you know, I can't pimp it enough. It's 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 uh, really great to give you a minimum bar uh, on your build pipeline security-wise. Of hey, if I'm pushing however many times a day to some environment, I want some minimum security bar, and something like Gauntlet can really help that. Um, hey, let's test my container. Make sure I didn't open any ports I didn't mean to, or or, or anything like that. That's a whole presentation by itself. We've done it for few years at South by, it's two and a half hours long. So go check it out if you're really interested in that. Um, and, and yeah, okay, so I make, this, I make this nice pink asterisk claim at the bottom here um, that continuous integration is no longer a nice to have, right? Um, for security, it's an absolute must, and I actually have some, uh, some, some data to back that up, right? So um, this is from the most recent Verizon data breach incident report that just came out uh, this past week, last week, I, I forget. Um, but uh, it's really big pile of data about all sorts of security in, uh, incidents and data loss that, that has happened in the past year. And uh, the top graph is uh, time to compromise, uh, which is on the magnitude, the majority of time is on the magnitude of minutes. Uh, and then time to data, data exfiltration uh, for any of the incidents that did actually result in data loss. Uh, that happened within uh, minutes sometimes, but most of the time days. So uh, that's when I look at people with their inability to push code out at least daily and say good luck, right? Uh, if, you, if you don't have the ability to push quality code out that you know what you're pushing out, that has been tested, that has gone through some review process at least daily, uh, you know, hopefully much quicker than that, uh, kind of good luck keeping up with the bad guys. Guess what, bad guys don't have a two week release cycle. Uh, they don't have change management. They don't have an SDLC. They just want your data. Right, so uh, if you can't work at the same speed they do, they're going to beat you every time. Um, so monitoring. So this, uh, these last couple slides, last two slides, uh, are a whole presentation unto themselves. Uh, if if you guys really uh, you know want security stuff, maybe I'll write some blog posts. Maybe we can talk about this later. Um, but I'm I'm going to touch on a whole bunch of stuff in the last few minutes here that are really important and what I've been spending most of my my day time on. Um, so this is also from the DBIR. Uh, this graph shows the breach discovery method, basically how a company that was breached found out that they were breached. Um, and if you look at that nice red line, that's they found it themselves, which is nice at the bottom. Um, so that, that happens least frequently. Most frequently is law enforcement. So hey, FBI knocked on your door and said, uh, by the way, 
uh, we see a whole lot of really bad traffic coming out of your data center. Uh, you should probably figure that out. Um, another one is third party. I'm going to call that one the Brian Krebs uh, line. If any of you follow Brian Krebs' blog, uh, you don't want a phone call from Brian Krebs. He's a journalist that reports on uh, security incidents and, and he, he usually finds a lot of this stuff and then calls people and says, hey, by the way, uh, a uh, whole bunch of your passwords are being sold on the black market, and I just saw it, and they didn't know that they were even breached, right? And then things like fraud detection tools and stuff like that. So mantra from, from this, this takeaway is log absolutely everything and watch your logs. Don't just, don't just log everything. Actually watch your logs, right? So this is kind of my money slide. Um, this is kind of my, uh, my recommendation of kind of the tool set and the tooling that uh, you, should, you should really look into if, uh, if you want to do monitoring uh, seriously, uh, especially in this kind of uh, environment in, in cloud computing and, and the containerization. So Elasticsearch is pretty much black magic. For, uh, is anyone, everyone can agree, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of, a, uh, it's, it's non-trivial to stand up and keep running, uh, but, you know, and playing nice with everything else. But, it, it, you know, it's a great place uh, if you don't have money for Splunk. Right, so <laughs> uh, it, it works great. So um, you've probably heard the saying, "Don't roll your own crypto." Right? Never roll your own crypto. Hopefully, you've all kind of heard that. And don't roll, you don't roll your own crypto. Uh, also, don't roll your own logging solution at all, or uh, logging transportation. So things like RSYSLOG and RELP and some other tools. If you want to deal with Logstash, cool. Good luck. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like to play that game. So we use uh, RSLSLOG and RELP. There's an open source tool called StreamStash that, that we like. I don't know why I didn't put a bullet for it, but it's called StreamStash. Um, it's a node project, makes, makes LogStash look silly with how easy it is to use. Um, how many people use AuditD? No one, no one, cool. All right, we'll start looking into AuditD. Um, there's a project that I'm uh, helping uh, get out the door that is Audit D rewritten in Golang that we're going to open source this year. Um, so you can look into that. What Audit D allows you to do is at a kernel level monitor everything that happens on, on, your, on your machine, right? So for us, that's great. It's like, okay, I'm going to spit every command that anyone runs on any of my production boxes to Elasticsearch, and I'm going to monitor who's running what on what machines, when and why, and all this kind of stuff. Hey, Dan, why'd you run curl on this box? And uh, why'd you do wget to this website? And, why is it in Russia, right? You know, these are things that you can monitor for at a kernel level, so even, uh, even rootkits uh, type stuff will get caught by Audit D. It's super low level. Uh, OS Query, anyone? Anyone familiar with OS Query? A few, no? Um, OS Query is an open source tool written uh, out of Facebook. Uh, it exposes um, host level commands that are run and logs in a SQL query-like format. So it's really easy to query what's been run, what is running, uh, I prefer it more for endpoint, but a lot of people use it for infrastructure. Uh, I prefer Audit D for infrastructure, but they kind of have their own benefits, and so I put them both up here. Uh, obviously, your Nginx logs and all your Docker standard out stuff. Uh, what I did is actually wrote an rsyslog uh, service in Kubernetes that sits and kind of acts as my pipeline to Streamstash and Elasticsearch. Um, to get all of the above into, into logging, right? Uh, all my web logs, all my container logs, everything. Uh, there's a tool that you can build on top of Elasticsearch that you can that you use to build alerting on top of Elasticsearch called ElastAlert. It's put out by Yelp Open Source. Um, that, it's, it's also magic, it's great. Uh, you can do all sorts of threshold uh, alerts, uh, tie into email, Jira, Slack, whatever the heck you're going to tie into, but that's that's really cool to sit, really powerful to sit on top of Elasticsearch, and write queries and alert you of something that's going on. Slack bots are great ones. SSH connections, like I, every time someone SSHs into one of my Bastion jump hosts, jump hosts, I get a alert uh, in Slack. Just, I mean, it's kind of noisy, but I know who's logging into my gateway to my box, except for kubectl, right? But I know who's logging in to, to whatever box uh, and uh, when and from what, what IP address and things like that. Uh, the sus suspicious commands I already, already hit on. That's a great way to use Audit D and, and kind of pump those alerts out to Elasticsearch. And uh, file watches, right? What files just do you know 
like you all know on your system what are sensitive files, right? No vendor can come in and tell you what your magic file is. Uh, you know, this could be credentials, this could be you know some sensitive data, uh, this could be whatever whatever it is that is your crown jewels. Audit D, you can write some rules to do some file watching and who's accessing those, who's failing to access those, right? Because the bad guys li land on your box. They don't know what permission level they have right away, so they're going to get permission denied a few times. You can check that out. Um, and then just anomalies, right? The, uh, this is kind of, you know what your anomalies look like, right? Like some vendor's not going to come in and say, we're going to do anomaly detection with machine learning and unicorn poop, right? They're not going to, like, they don't know what, what anomaly is for you, right? If they're in learning mode and you're getting, like, attacked during learning mode, good luck ever catching anything ever again, right? So what are your anomalies, right? Like, um, I, a friend of mine tracked every IP address he ever hit his production system for, from for a year. Uh, does anyone have that number in their head of how many different IP addresses you've logged in to your, you know, your prod backend services from? His was like sub 100. That's like digestible, right? That's like not, you know, immanageable. Um, so these screenshots on the bottom are, are from a tool called Signal Sciences, and this is kind of our anomaly detection. You can build, hey, we know what our login failure and login success looks like. Uh, so we can map that and say, okay, I've got a spike in failed logins. What's going on? And I can kind of look at that. And then same thing for all these things on the, on the right. Hey, spikes in 404s probably means someone's crawling around for something. 500s, they're doing something even weirder. You know, data center traffic, those IPs are all public. And who should be using your app from a data center? No one, right? So kind of look for that stuff. Um, like I said, this slide is basically a talk by itself. So I talked, I said a lot really fast. <laughs> this is probably an hour long talk by itself, but I wanted to kind of put this out there for you guys. That's pretty much it. I got the big zero, so I don't know if I have time for questions, but uh, you can feel free to, to find me. I'll be around for the next two days, and I'm local in Austin here too, so yeah, you can, that's my Twitter account. And we can do questions? Okay, cool. We can do some questions. Any? Yeah. Right, so uh, if you find one, let me know. <laughs> uh, it's also what I want. Uh, OS query can help you there if you're doing it on your endpoints. Um, hey, what command is run? Hey, run alerts if some kube command is run, kubectl command is run. Uh, it's not like a native integration. It's more like, hey, I want to know what's, what's going on on this box. Um, OS Query, it's open source, so open source is free like a puppy is free, right? So you gotta, you know, you gotta clean up after it and, and you know, train it to, to behave and do what you need to do. But uh, it's, it's a really powerful tool. Users, meaning? So like your developers, what their commands? Uh, built in, not that I know of, they do have, in, in GKE, it's all fluent D to Google Cloud Logging, which I've, uh, I'm sorry if anyone in the room works on this, I found it absolutely useless. Uh, it's, it's, it's less than real time. It's like, it's, it's the UDP of logging. Like some show up, some don't. Uh, if they show up, they don't show up anywhere near real time. Uh, I was really trying to test that. I, w I wanted it to work so bad. Um, it, and it just didn't for me. Uh, I just don't know if it's, it's there yet. But in terms of commands being run, no, and that, that, that's all just the, the container standard out logs. Commands being run, no, nothing out of the box. That's why I've been leaning on this audit D stuff, because um, it's unavoidable. Um, it's, it's kernel level logging. You can't, you can't, can't turn it off. <laughs> if you do, I know, right? That's another bullet I should have put up. Canaries are a really cool thing. Hey, this thing stopped giving me logs. Why, right? Uh, is something bad, or did someone figure it out and turn it off? Right. That's that's a that's a log event that I also want. Right. Uh, the absence of logs. <laughs> Any other questions?
Right, so you're looking at the security team of Honest Dollar? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's literally just me. So uh, that's why I like the alerting that is mine. Like, I built my alerting, so I know exactly what I'm alerting on so that I don't have to be overwhelmed with false positives or noise. Uh, it, it wasn't tuning, it was, it was what did I turn on, right? Uh, so things like a last, a last alert, like, hey, let me know if something, some log event goes over some threshold, right? You, you're gonna learn over time just by storing all of your data, what is anomalous and what you care about, right? Um, we have a pretty small team. There's on any given day four or five people that are logging into the to the back end. So just let me know every time they they get in, right? Right now that's not too noisy for me. Ask me next year if that's too noisy for me. <laughs> but you know, and then maybe I'll I'll fine tune that on anomalous logins only. But right now every login's good and I can kind of scroll through a Slack channel and say, hey that's an IP that should never have done that, right? Um, yeah, but uh, Kibana on top of Elasticsearch is really good at also spotting what you're what you're what you're storing, and um, I, I like the start noisy and then figure out how to clean up, right? Because if you go the other way, you don't know what you're missing, you don't know what you're gonna rule out from the beginning. So, you know, if you if you start just storing every log that you possibly can and don't let any log die, and then look at it and say, okay, what looks strange to me, what do I care about? What is Google coming into my environment and running an upgrade or something like that? What's just noise of being on the internet? And what's, hey, this is someone using my app in a way that I wanna know about, right? Um, things like that. Like we don't have a single PHP file in our thing. So hey, every time someone tries to find a PHP file, I might wanna consider that IP address stupid and bad, right? Like things like that, right? Okay, and you build your own alerting out over time. And then honestly, that's what I think that any security people in the room, that's your secret sauce. What you're looking for is your advantage over all the bad guys. So everyone always says, hey, the blue team's got the harder job and the red team's got the easy job because they only need to find one bug and the blue team needs to fix all bugs. Uh, the, one d the one thing they leave out there is the red team doesn't know what the blue team's looking for, right? They, they don't have invisibility cloaks when they come in and, and uh, and start doing stuff. So, you know, even with a even with a zero day, like something's gonna look weird to me, right? So if if they don't know how to avoid what I'm looking for on my system, I've got a slight advantage there too, right? So all right. Let's uh, give Matt a round of applause. Cool. Thanks guys. And we'll be back here at eleven forty five for another Kubernetes talk.